What makes Web3 different is the ability to own the actual network. And that's what crypto assets themselves represent. Or take Ethereum, which is easier to understand. Yes, welcome back everybody to Altcoin Daily. My name's Austin. In today's video, I want to continue our series of looking at the long-term potential of certain cryptos. And today, go deep into the Ethereum network. Why I believe ETH will continue to grow and in value into 2030 and beyond. And I'm talking about the real reason. Actual charts, actual data, other channels won't show you, I will, along with a clip of United States Congress talking about Ethereum and the potential Web3 has looking forward. So, like always, check the timestamps down below in the video description, smash the like button, and let's jump in, starting with just what is Ethereum and why does Ethereum have value? If this is too basic, feel free to skip ahead. Like I said, timestamps below. And I do just have to mention before we start, Number one, I am not a registered financial advisor. I'm just sharing my journey, what works for me, make your own decisions. Number two, anything could happen in the short term. We could go much lower throughout the rest of this year. Today's video is about the long term, the 2030 outlook and beyond. And of course, number three, this is video two in our multi-part series looking at the long-term potential of certain cryptos. If you hold Bitcoin, very important breakdown. Seek it out. Check this out. Link down below. And with that being said, let's jump in. In 90 seconds or less, what is Ethereum? Ethereum is the world's second largest crypto project by market cap and was the first to introduce smart contract functionality to the industry, meaning dApps, decentralized applications that you can build on top. And that's why ETH and Bitcoin are very different, but very valuable in their own sense. Bitcoin is a non-sovereign, hard cap supply, global, immutable, decentralized store of value, basically like a digital gold, allowing individuals to be their own bank, while Ethereum is more like a permissionless supercomputer that allows individuals to have banking type services, like lending and borrowing in a totally permissionless, peer-to-peer -peer way that eliminates middlemen. Ethereum enthusiasts aim to hand back control to the users meaning developers can use Ethereum to build leaderless applications, which means that a user's data cannot be tampered with by the services creators. Another word for this is Web3. That's a buzzword we've been hearing a lot, but that is the explanation of Ethereum in a nutshell. Now, the potential of where Ethereum could be in this next decade is huge. Watch this crypto expert, Brian Brooks, explain blockchain to Congress. This is about a full five minute clip, but so valuable. And while he will use the terms Bitcoin and Ethereum a little bit, when he uses the term Web3, in this case, he is primarily speaking about Ethereum. So very quickly, what is Web3? Well, Web1, as most of us remember, was read only static websites. Yahoo, Google, etc. They were non-interactive and just kept everything pretty much siloed off to themselves. Read only. Web 2 then evolved to read and write, i.e. interactive. That was the Facebooks, the LinkedIns, the Gmails, anything that was now interactive. And then, of course, Web 3, verifiable ownership in the digital world, now with the use of blockchain. If this is still confusing, I want you to watch this clip. They'll go over it. They'll ask. They'll define Web 3 from the start. But then listen to the follow-up questions on why Web 3 i.e. cryptocurrency, i.e. Ethereum, is not going away. This is a five-minute clip, so valuable. Watch this, then we'll get to the real reason, actual charts and data, why Ethereum is only growing bigger. But watch this. Mr. Brooks, let's step back from digital assets and blockchain for a moment. Let's talk about where the internet was, where it's come to, where it's going. What we're hearing now is Web3. Policymakers need to understand the nature of Web3. This is a hearing about a component of Web3. Now, along those lines, what are the characteristics that defined Web1 and Web2? Mr. McHenry, thank you very much for that question. I think that's critical to understanding what we're all trying to build here. <clears throat> so the characteristic of Web1, if people remember their original AOL account, was an ability to look in a curated walled garden at a set of content that was not interactive but was presented to you on AOL the way that Time Magazine used to show you the articles they wanted you to see inside of their magazine. Just you could see it on a screen. 
The innovation of Web 2 was that suddenly you could not only read content, but you could also write content. This is when the blogosphere became a, a big thing. People remember this from the late 90s, the early 2000s. <clears throat> the reason for the centralization of the internet, of course, was that all of that activity was being monetized by a very small number of companies. Facebook, as the chairwoman, as chairwoman mentions, Google, and two or three other companies. What makes Web3 different is the ability to own the actual network. And that's what crypto assets themselves represent, is an ownership stake in an underlying network. So when you hear people talk about, for example, layer one tokens, what they mean is, this is your reward for providing the ledger maintenance services, the computing power to the network that on web one and two was done by Google, right? So now people in my hometown of Pueblo, Colorado can actually own the Ethereum network, but they can't own the internet. That's owned by Google and a few other companies. That's what the project of crypto is all about, is allowing people to directly own the networks that are, have native assets that are supporting it, and that's the nature of decentralization where the token holders are the people who control the asset, okay. so not the Google. Token holders, for, for our language here on the Hill, those are digital assets, right? Which are the keys to open up the ledger for you to participate, right? Correct. So describe to us how those digital assets fit into this internet revolution, Web3. <clears throat> so, so, so the concept is that you have sort of application layer tokens and you have protocol layer tokens. So if I'm an owner of Bitcoin, let's say that I'm a miner of Bitcoin, somebody who actually creates Bitcoin. The Bitcoin is the reward I receive for doing the work to keep the network operational. And that allows me to own a piece of the Bitcoin blockchain. Or take Ethereum, which is easier to understand. The Ether token represents an ownership stake in the network, but on top of that network are all kinds of apps that get built on the network, much like the apps on your phone depend on the underlying network existing that lets the phone operate. And so people will make judgments about which network is likely to win, and they will invest in the tokens in that network much the same way you might invest in Google stock because you think Google is going to scale access to the original internet. The difference being here, you can vote on what happens in the future of a proof of stake network, for example. You can get rewarded through a proof of work token for maintaining a ledger on something like Bitcoin. But the real message here is that what happens on the decentralized internet is decided by the investors versus what happens on the main internet is decided by Twitter, Facebook, Google, and a small number of other companies. Okay, so. All right, what do you think? Are you still with me? If you're still watching, if you're still learning, comment grape down below. Let me know you're there. But I wanted to share this with you because this represents the discussions that we're all having globally on what this technology could do. And I know what you may be saying. You're saying, Austin, if you love Ethereum so much, just wait until you check out some of the competitors like Solana, like Polkadot. Hey, wait till you check out Cardano, so much better. But there is a reason we're seeing so much of the development activity still on Ethereum. And I'll show you. Now, I will be doing similar type videos on a select few other altcoins. Like I said, today's video is only number two in our multi-part series. So if you have an altcoin that you really believe in, that you'd like to see a video like this in the future, comment down below. I'll be checking your comments now. But what is the real reason that I feel Ethereum is not going away, and in fact, only growing bigger in this next decade? Well, it's because of the fundamentals meaning the developers, meaning the actual building of dApps taking place, which chains is that happening the most on? Well, for that, let's go into the dApp industry report for Q2 2022 overview, which is the most recent report we have so far. But for now, let's look at the most recent stats, i.e. fundamentals that make a blockchain valuable. First up, we'll take a look at total value locked TVL, which really defines which chain is being used the most for DeFi decentralized lending and borrowing. Well, Ethereum remains the most dominant chain and has actually improved its dominance to 69% with $48 billion in TVL, 11% higher than the close of Q1. Binance is once again runner up with $6 billion in TVL, while Polygon, Solana, Avalanche follow the Binance branded blockchain closely and should remain among the top DeFi destinations in the future. So just looking at TVL, Ethereum's in first by leaps and bounds, followed by Binance, then Tron, Avalanche, Solana, Polygon, etc. Now, 
in a bear market like now, we are in a bear market, I would expect this trend and this sort of separation to continue. Because in bull markets, Ethereum fees get outrageous. We're in a bear market, so it's much less expensive to use the most popular chain. Once a bull market comes back, and let's say Ethereum is still not scalable, that's when these alternative L1s, I feel, really tend to shine. And next up, what about developers? Because for me, wherever the developers go, the money tends to follow. Why developer count matters? Well, fundamental metrics at minimum should hold true beyond short-term value. So yes, Ethereum is tanking this year, but these fundamental metrics give us a clear picture multi years from now. While TVL gives us an indication about the number of users investing into a blockchain project, looking at developer contributions tells us something about the builders and the brains behind the project. In short, TVL tells us about demand, while developer headcount tells us about supply because they're the ones actually using the block space. This is a recently published report by Electric Capital who analyzed up to 500,000 unique code repositories, excluding copy pasting of code, and 160 million code commits across Web3 to study which blockchain had the highest number of active developer engagement. What were the results? It's no surprise that Ethereum leads the race on total developers with a total of almost 3,000 developers in 2020, almost 4,000 in 2021. And Ethereum also attracts the largest percentage of all developers entering Web3. And that's the network effect Ethereum has. Ethereum consistently draws 20 to 25% of all the developers coming to Web3. So they're number one, who would be second and third? Following Ethereum is the cross-chain layer one, sometimes referred to as layer zero, Polkadot, and then Cosmos, then Solana, then Bitcoin, and number four. Give me your thoughts on this down below. And again, I am bullish on Polkadot. I am bullish on Solana, Cosmos, Cardano. In terms of watching and seeing the potential they could bring to crypto, the developers that will build on them, but especially in a bear market, block space isn't that expensive, relatively speaking, and usually the higher caps gain in dominance. All right, that is the video. My name's Austin. Like always, see you tomorrow.